All right, we are ready. All right, perfect. Should I just start, Rams? Uh, you are on mute, Rams. I'm gonna start. I'm waiting for media to tell me to go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. So, welcome back to the second workshop of the Biolocal Summit 2022, brought to you by Proudly South African. Now, you know, oftentimes when we get into business, we just want to do what we do. I, I just want to sell chicken. I just want to, to paint houses. I just want to build cars. I want to build ideas. I want to, I'm a content producer, personally. I just want to produce content and get it out there and make money. But of course, there are boxes to tick. And those boxes are typically registration and compliance. And some of us fail because of those small boxes. Not because we don't have a great business behind us, but because we fail on small things like your SARS registration. And if you're going to go and look for government money, well, government can't give you money if you're not going to pay back your taxes. So this session is going to focus on registration and compliance. And trust me, it is as important as funding, as important as coaching, all those conversations we had in the first session do not mean a thing if your registration and your compliance is in the doldrums. So joining me are two speakers who are going to focus on these conversations. And as usual, I'd like to get your questions. Uh, please click on uh, Q&A or discuss, send your questions there. And uh, when they have finished presenting, we will then ask them your questions. I'm going to give each of them about 20 minutes to make a presentation. If they make it in less than 20 minutes, the happier I get, because then we get more opportunities to ask questions of them. My first speaker, who's going to look at compliance issues and protecting intellectual property uh, with CIPC, legal rights, and amongst others, is Amanda Lutherangen. She's Senior Manager, Copyright and Enforcement uh, at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. That's the, com that's the organization that registers your business. The name may sound strange, but that's what they do. They just register businesses. Amanda, <laughs> we are Goeiemiddag, and I'm very privileged to be in the company of such a seasoned presenter. Um, you're a hot act to follow, Rams. Uh, the check is in the mail, Amanda, and the platform is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope um, you can see me and you can hear me clearly and um, all systems go from my side. <clears throat> all right, you actually um, talked only about half what the CIPC does. So we do register companies and that's our passion and our business, but we also register intellectual property rights. And IP rights is fundamental to your business. It's like the blood in your veins. And I want to talk to you today about compliance on both sides. Register your intellectual property rights, but then also make sure that you respect the rights of others. <clears throat> and that's where enforcement of IP rights come into play. I'm going to do my best to talk to you within 20 minutes. It usually takes me hours to share this passion that I have for enforcement of IP rights. But I'm going to make sure that I make you happy today. Rams and leave some time for questions. So in South Africa, we have uh, law enforcement agencies responsible to enforce intellectual property rights. And I'm not going to give you all the details because you can read up on registering a trademark. The videos are available on the CIPC website. That's www.cipc.co.za. And there's step-by-step -step guides when, when you want to register a trademark and if all else fails just send me an email my email address is also on the website but once you have this registration you need protection you need to be sure that nobody will use your trademark that you've registered and build a business around without your permission making a fake product by using your trademark 
So in South Africa, we have law enforcement agencies taking care of this responsibility, but we do not have a cross-cutting strategy to fight counterfeiting. And that's where CIPC also comes in. We rally all stakeholders together. And we were very pri um, privileged to have your marketing director at Proudly SA joining us at a training workshop two weeks ago in Cape Town talking about the value of the South African brand and also the value of branding in general. So what do we do? <clears throat> we look at information campaigns against counterfeiting, and this is part of what I'm doing today, sharing information with you and the participants. We agree on temp um, common technical ground. So we make sure that the law enforcement, the police officials and the customs out there understand what to look for and how to identify the products and get the experts in if they need um, products to be identified. And then we also look at Africa, <clears throat> not only to South Africa because of our porous borders and good strands sitting through our country into other countries. And South Africa is the major port into the rest of Africa. All of the enforcement and registration is done based on international agreements that South Africa has signed. One of these agreements called the WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization's Development Agenda, Recommendation 45, and this is very technical, but it actually speaks in Article 7 about the balancing of these rights. We have to balance private rights with public rights, and in that process, make sure that we protect the public interest. And this becomes very relevant when you talk about pharmaceuticals and medicines. <clears throat> and especially with the pandemic that we faced the last two years, we're going into the third year, we had real problems with personal protective gear being counterfeited and medicines coming into our country being sold as the real McCoy, and it's actually a fake. All of this is also underwritten by strategic direction from our government. We fall within the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition's uh, mandate, and we're one of their um, partner agencies. And we get our cue in terms of strategy directly from the Department of Trade and Industry. We have our legislation that um, prescribes the registration of trademarks as well as the protection thereof. I mentioned the Counterfeit Goods Act. But the CCRD, that's part of the Department of Trade Industry and Competition, they look at revising the legislation, making sure that we've got the tools to protect intellectual property rights. Our vision is to make sure that we get the registrations. As Ram said in the beginning of intellectual property rights, you can register in South Africa a patent, design, and a trademark, but copyright is a natural right. So you don't have to register copyright. You just have to keep evidence that you're the creator, and that makes you the owner of copyright. We then are um, responsible for education and awareness and making sure that we enforce the legislation. If you have a registered trademark and it cannot be enforced, the trademark's not even worth the paper <clears throat> that it's printed on. We also go out of our way to support innovation and creativity in South Africa. We work very closely with partner organizations like the Small Business Development Department, the um, CEDAs of this world, to guide SMMEs into the value of IP, give them the necessary support. These supports are also available in international structures. And we work very closely with WIPO, the USPTO, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the European IP Office, the Japan Patent Office. So we have links available and we can guide you. So please reach out to us if you do have the latest innovation, especially in the green technology, and we will assist as far as best we can. We <clears throat> give the effective protection through registration of trademarks, as I mentioned. Uh, the only copyright that you can register is the copyright in a film. And that was done because of the high instances of films being pirated in the past. Recent days, the technology lends itself to an environment where people can legitimately watch the latest movies. And that was one of the ways in which industry came to the party to combat piracy, to give people content when they need it and how they need it, and to gain um, access to that content legitimately. We drive awareness and build capacity. We do training workshops for the police officials out there so that they understand the intellectual property value to our economy and how it supports investment into our country and jobs and grow um, 
new jobs, sustainable jobs in various industries. We administer the implementation of the Act, so we play a regulative role, making sure that everybody is drawn into a discussion forum where we can discuss the way forward in terms of strategies to make sure that we've got a credible intellectual property system that makes it easy and possible for foreign investment to come into our country. Our operation. I cannot say enough about cooperation. The internal working relationship between different government agencies that's responsible for enforcement of intellectual property rights is key to the success. And then we can also not forget about the demand for these counterfeit goods. So creating general awareness with the public and guiding businesses into compliance. And we've done a number of these compliance exercises, especially in the copyright area, where we looked at software use in SMMEs and big business and how they comply <clears throat> to the requirements of intellectual property right uses. Consumer demand, why do people buy counterfeit goods? Why is it so alluring? And I've had it many times, people say, well, it's cheaper, why would I pay more for the real product? But they do not see the bigger picture and it's very important for us to change behavior so that people think differently about the impact of counterfeit goods and don't see it as a faceless crime anymore. We, um, if we have IP right infringement and enforcement happening in a balanced way, we see increased effectiveness, we bring down the costs of IP enforcement, we gather intelligence. And the pictures I'm going to show you just now will demonstrate that we're no longer facing small businesses involved in petty crimes. This is organized crime operations that's involved in counterfeiting. <clears throat> the uh, partnerships, as I've mentioned, cooperation, I've said enough about partnerships are crucial if we don't have close partnerships with IP rights owners so that we can assist them to um, protect IP rights. And if we don't have the political will and buy-in, and I can assure you that the Minister of Trade and Industry that um, currently is heading our Department of um, trade and industry and competition is very committed to intellectual property rights and the protection thereof. This responsibility doesn't only lie with government, but it is the responsibility of government to protect consumers and to make sure that we balance this protection between legitimate IP rights and protecting consumers against the harms of counterfeiting. What do we see if we have excellent collaborations? We see game changers. We see simplified processes that increase our efficiencies and give us game changers. Just quickly, our main role players in the area of intellectual property rights is our police services, where you can lodge a complaint if your rights are infringed. SAS, that makes sure that imports into the country is legitimate and doesn't infringe IP rights. Our IP rights holders, yourselves, businesses, future creators and innovators in our country, you will be IP rights holders, and then the CIPC. We have an operational function as well when we talk to training uh, law enforcement officials. And I just want to quickly show you a few pictures of the kind of things we've seen in our marketplaces. <clears throat> we have seen fast moving consumer goods spiraling, spiraling out of control. We have seen spices, um, detergents. We have even seen repackaging of uh, goods we use on a daily basis like rice and uh, infringing on the copyright of the known brand like that we all know, Tastic. We have seen counterfeit medicines, which is a big problem because online selling of these medicines is a very difficult area to enforce. You can take down a website, but it doesn't prevent the culprit from just opening a new website and selling to an unsuspected old person in an old age home that's looking for a cheaper option of medicines. So we really have to get the word out there. One of the products we all know, uh, it's well known to most of us, it's a headache powder. This was manufactured a few years ago in South Africa. And this is not how pharmaceuticals are supposed to be manufactured. This is something you'll drink and consume. And just look at this environment. <clears throat> this was the mixing plant in progress. So these are the kind of things that you need to realize as a consumer and a business when you do buy things um, that's not authorized or that you're not sure about the trusting of the source of the product. 
Um, this is just some examples of things that were found in Taiwan where they made counterfeit medicines. We have seen in our marketplaces also sunlight liquid. And lately, we have seen these bottles being refilled with just the green-like substance that doesn't have any of the real value um, that can wash your dishes clean with just one drop. Okay. In January, February, when schools reopen, you even see counterfeit stationery um, coming to the fore. Um, there's no time to share this video with you, but it is available on YouTube. We have counterfeit water in South Africa, where the original Volpre bottles were just refilled by a very poor quality of water from a fire detergent, and it was sold as the real um, product. A very important partner to the work that we do is the media. They need to talk about the successes. They need to cover the search and seizure operations so that we can make sure that we address the demand and inform the general public about the harms of this. The, when you have already got registered IP rights, there is a process that you need to follow to enforce these rights. You have to lodge a complaint in terms of the Counterfeit Goods Act, and eventually it will be destroyed or recycled or upcycled, something that we are currently looking into. <clears throat> this is just some of the operations, multi-agency joint operations that we're involved in. Um, it is a very difficult crime to enforce, especially if it's already in the marketplaces. And you can see customs officials on board, police, metros, they are all together in this fight. At the bottom of the screen, you can see also one of the labs that we closed down in one of the operations with, that we did with Interpol. This is not only a crime that South Africa faces, it's an international crime. And we have seen many goods being imported into our country and also manufactured in these um, makeshift labs and then exported to neighboring countries. Okay, the current situation is law enforcement is quite involved. <clears throat> Everybody is taking up an effort it does look as if the powerpoint is a bit slow so there's a few stumbling blocks that makes it difficult for law enforcement um, to become effective and some of these stumbling blocks i'm just going to share with you and it is because it's quite expensive to enforce ip rights we have to follow through we have to make sure that our transgressors has got knowledge we have to educate our consumers there's a lot of ethics at play here and we've got rights owners that has a specific responsibility to want to protect their ip rights um <clears throat> i think in terms of time i have three more minutes rams if you would like to allow me just to finish off so what is it that we get when we cooperate? As I said in my previous slides, we see game changers. And once you've got a shared goal and you align your objectives, things start to happen miraculously. We had a, a discussion the other day about trust. And we had listed a number of things that's important when you speak about trusting your partnerships. And one of the guys just said we have to have something in common. So you have to have a common goal or a shared goal, and that was actually very important. So for us to be effective, we need all of you guys on board. We need you to be part of the fight against counterfeit goods and copyright piracy. We need you to change the behavior, and we also, from a business perspective, need you to register your intellectual property rights so that your business can benefit from these rights. So just sharing lastly a few new strategies. We are looking at intelligence-driven operations. So please, there's a lot of hotlines available. If you do have information about counterfeit goods being sold, share that with us. We do market sweeps from time to time. It's multi-agency joint operations with a balanced approach. And then we've done a lot of awareness campaigning. <clears throat> Be your own, buy your own. It fits very nicely with the Proudly South Africa um, objectives of buying local. We want to make sure that you respect your rights and those of others. We had this idea conservation campaign running a few years, and we're definitely looking at upping our game in terms of creating awareness and using the social media platforms available to share this kind of information. 
10 steps to success, um, law enforcement training, as I mentioned, international cooperation, reinforcement of our regional forums. It's crucial because Africa has recently signed our African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the borders will become closer to one another and eventually Africa will just be one continent. So we need to work very closely with our counterparts in Africa. In conclusion from me, Measures to deal with this trade are an integral part of the government's attempts to create a predictable and stable economic environment. As one of these measures, the Counterfeit Goods Act provides a mechanism that endeavors to combat the trading in counterfeit goods and assist in growing the South African economy. I hope I've given you some thought for food, food for thought this afternoon. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be welcome to take them. My contact details are up there. My cell phone number is available. You're welcome to phone me anytime. I will answer and come back to you if I'm not available. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Rams. I will tell you this much, uh, Amanda, that uh, that slip was a very important slip. You have actually given me thought for food. I have heard about so many fake things. I could never imagine fake water. So I am now thinking about food. So I've got thought for food, but we'll come back to that uh, later. Thank you very much for your presentation. Amanda, Amanda Lotherengen uh, from the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, CIPC. I, I noticed there are no questions so far, and that's typical. So you see, people get it said they want money, but they forget to tick the right boxes. So they, you need to know that if you don't tick the right boxes with Amanda, you're not going to get the money from the guys we spoke to earlier. So you got to get involved. I mean, I'd like to know a lot of things about this in intellectual property stuff and uh, copyright and, and all those things. But later when I ask questions, our next presentation is very interesting, and I'm going to preface it by this. One of the most shocking things that I ever uh, had to encounter was going through government forms and, and I was asked if I was black. And I was like, sorry? But, well, you know, that's what it is. There's things that we call BEE codes. And sometimes they will rule you not black enough, even if you think you're black. We need to understand these and get some education about how the BEE codes uh, work and how they can have a positive uh, impact on your, on your business, but mostly on localization, because localization has become the Trump word in government business. Government will support more of those businesses that have more inputs that are local than us. You know, you know what we do most. We, we start a business, then we buy everything else from outside the country, and then we claim this is a, a local product. When the truth is, the only thing that's local is me, the proprietor. The rest of the input is foreign. Now, that's not going to work. And that is why Lindu Matonsa, a senior manager, education and advocacy, uh, education, advocacy and awareness at the Triple BE Commission is here to help us understand that and hopefully help us to do business better. Sabona, Lindu. Sabona, Ramsunjan. <laughs> so the stage is all yours. But because I discriminate no. against people, I'm going to give you not 20 minutes, but 19.7 minutes. <laughs> Ooh, I'm not sure if it's fair discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> you all have, you have your 20 minutes, my sister. It's all yours. Okay, no. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, I think my role today will be to present on the Triple B legislation particularly linking it to what the summit currently is focusing on, uh, the development of SMMEs as well as the aspect pertaining to localization. So my presentation will then look at, uh, this is the outline of the presentation, what is it that we're going to cover? So it's always important that when you talk about the B legislation, we always emphasize what actually the legislation means because you do come across a lot of narratives or a whole lot of theories uh, which seeks to explain what the B legislation is. And some of those theories do not particularly align to what the legislation has provided for. And we'll also look at how do we promote aspects around localization, particularly looking at the pillars that the B legislation provides for. We'll also look at the challenges that currently are being faced which is hindering aspects around localization, aspects around the promotion and the growing of black businesses. 
Now, what is the triple B legislation? Now, the legislation itself has defined what is triple B. When we talk about triple B, we are talking about uh, economic empowerment of all black people. And there are also instances where the legislation zooms in into those groupings that were further marginalized. And that will cover women, will cover workers. That is why in certain pillars around triple B, you will see aspect around employee ownership programs. And the legislation also seeks to make sure that there's empowerment of black youth, of black people living with disabilities, people from rural and underdeveloped areas. Now, particularly how does then the, the legislation seeks to increase or empower black people? The legislation says the first thing that we need to focus on is that we need to make sure that we increase the number of black people that own, manage, and control enterprises as well as the productive assets of the South African economy. Now, this becomes critical because then the legislation says we want to see the ownership patterns of the South African economy changing. We want to see the increase of Black people within the management structures of the various enterprises. And this could be attained through Black people coming into existing enterprises or the support that is facilitated through the different pillars of the legislation that will eventually see Black people owning and managing their own enterprises. And then also the legislation when it talks about management as well as ownership of the productive assets of the South African economy, it brings in the the broad-based aspect. And that is the inclusion of communities, of workers, as well as corporates and other collective schemes That is why when you look at the pillars, particularly around ownership, you'll find that there is also focus around the inclusion of communities through broad-based ownership schemes or um, cooperative enterprises, or even the inclusion of workers through employee ownership program. That is because the legislation seeks to ensure that we do create avenues to include broad-based participation. And the legislation also focuses on human resources and skills development, that sometimes you may come across Black people who are not necessarily entrepreneurs, but how does the legislation support them? It supports them through the aspect around human resource and skills development. And the key thing around Triple B is that because when you talk about Black people, you find different sub-races, you find African colors and Indians who are South African by descent or by birth, and who are also South African through naturalization, and that naturalization could have taken place on or after the 27th of April, 1994. The legislation then finds it very critical to promote aspects around equitable representation, that these sub-races that form the whole entire group of black people must be equitably represented, uh, particularly when we talk about aspect around skills development and also aspect around management control. And then also Triple B, it talks about preferential procurement from Black-owned and managed enterprises. That is why there's an element uh, that looks at preferential procurement, and it has particularly provided a scorecard in terms of how we procure goods and services. And in doing so, bulk of the procurement spend is... Sorry to just interrupt. Uh, We cannot... Your slides are not moving, so I'm suspecting it's because they are not on slideshow. If you can just put them on slideshow, perhaps... Apologies, on my side is on slide show, but I'm still, I have not yet moved the slide. I'm on the slide oh, that okay. says triple B, yes. All right, so we are on your holding slide, basically the f- very first one that says 15 March. Is it? Can you see it now? It's not moving still. Is it not moving? No. Okay, because on my side it's moving. Apologies. Uh, okay. No, it's fine. Uh, you can proceed. I just thought maybe, yeah, you may proceed if you cannot change. Okay. Do I, can I stop sharing and share? If that will assist. Okay. So apologies for that. I was alerted that my slides are not moving. I hope they will move because uh, on my side they are moving. Then also when you look at the what is triple B making sure that uh, there's investments that are channeled also to Black-owned and managed enterprises. And these investments could take the form of either financial support or non-financial support, which the ultimate objective is to make sure that 
there is capacity building for black owned and managed enterprises. Then also, when you look at these triple B objectives, these triple B objectives then are translated into the various pillars or the elements within the codes of good practice. And then these elements then seek to always address a particular aspect around black economic empowerment. You've got the element that looks at empowering from the aspect of ownership. You've got the element that talks about empowerment from the aspect of management control. Then there's a pillar around skills development. There's also a pillar around enterprise and supply development as well as socioeconomic development. The pillar around enterprise and supply development looks at three things. It looks at preferential procurement, uh, which is the normal or the standard procurement of goods and services. And it also looks at uh, supply development around the identification of black owned entities on the supply databases and capacitating them so that they can be able to take advantage of the various economic opportunities that are made available by those particular entities. And then also there's an aspect around enterprise development that looks at now the provision of support, also either taking the form of enterprise de- of, of financial support or non-financial support to black owned entities that are outside the supply chain of those particular entities. Now the preferential procurement uh, spend uh, is divided into the various criteria. So there's always a, an indication of how much must be spent based on how compliant the entity is or based on the size of entity that it is. Now, the B legislation looks at entities from a point of view of the annual revenue that those entities generate. Now, based on the fact that you are either a small, medium, or large entity. Now, the preferential procurement scorecard says 80% of the procurement spent must be with entities that are so meaning that if you procure goods and services from entities that are not be compliant you will not be able to recognize points come your triple b verification and even if you are able to get points because maybe you do have entities that are compliant if bulk of your spend is with entities that are not compliant it will eventually affect how as an entity you are going to recognize points and the legislation says 15 percent must be with entities that are exempted microenterprises. Exempted microenterprises are entities that generate a revenue of between zero and less than 10 million. And these entities in terms of compliance, they can either present a triple B certificate or present, sorry, they'll only present a son of a David or a certificate issued by the companies and intellectual property systems when entities are doing their final annual returns worth CIPC or they're registering new entities that are able to get what we call a triple B certificate, which is equivalent to a son of a David. Again, 15% of the spend must be with entities that are within the category of qualifying small enterprises. And these are entities that are medium sized. Their revenue is between 10 million as well as 50 million. Now these entities will either present a triple B certificate or a son of a David. The son of a David will be for at least 51% black owned because they automatically receive a level two, and those that are 100% black owned will automatically receive a level one, and they only have to depose to a son of a David. Then 50%, which is bulk of the procurement spend, must be with entities that are 51% black owned. And 12% of the procurement spend must be with entities that are at least 30% black women owned. Now, also, when you look at the pillar around preferential procurement, it is critical that as part of localization, the preferential procurement uh, then looks at what we call imports in twofold. Now, we understand that during the course of business, there are entities that either import goods or services. Now, the reasons for importing such goods and services varies. There are instances where entities procure or procure imported goods or services because there's no local supplier. Now, the B legislation then also takes that into account and it imports into two forms of categories. It says you've got cat group one, which allows for continuing importation because there's no local manufacturer of those goods or services or because there is further value adding that takes place uh, within South Africa. Value adding can take place through the forms of packaging. Uh, it can take place through 
uh, the form around uh, distribution. So basically the legislation says if you are importing because of those uh, reasons, then you can continue to import. Then there's a second category of imports wherein the legislation says you are importing not necessarily because there's no local manufacturer uh, or someone that can locally provide those services. You are importing because of the brand specification or the technical specifications that are attached to those particular products or those particular services. And in this instance, the bill legislation says this is an area where we can bring localization or where we can open up market access for Black-owned entities. However, the legislation says this is not going to be automatic. It requires the entity that is importing those particular goods or services to develop what we call an import plan. And this import plan will then look at the identification of a Black-owned local entity that can then begin to provide those particular services or goods. Now, the import substitution or replacement does not look at the entire uh, component or the entire product that is being imported, but it considers aspect around the fact that you can look at certain inputs into that product or services that you can localize. Now then, the entity needs to have that plan, which will outline clear objectives of what that plan seeks to achieve. It will have clear interventions and key performance. And every time the entity is verified, then this plan also needs to be looked into to see that there is movement in terms of that particular plan so that it does not become a plan that God has does, but it becomes a plan that eventually will see that there will be a Black-owned entity that has been set up or established and that entity is now able to manufacture some of the components that the entity used to import. And then also, when you look at this particular pillar, then moving into the aspect of supply development, it says as an entity on an annual basis, you need to identify 51% and 100% Black-owned uh, exempted micro-enterprises as well as qualifying small enterprises. And you need to spend 2% of net profit after tax to capacitate these entities. Now, this is an area where sometimes as the regulator, we pick up non-compliance in the sense that, remember, it says you identify, you do a needs analysis because the support that you provide must be able to address the gap that exists within that particular beneficiary entity. So sometimes you find that entities, they do not do the needs analysis. They want to prescribe to the beneficiary entities the form of support or what the support will actually do. And in certain instances, there are also no supply development agreements. You find that the support comes, it's just a, rope, it's just a random. It is not strategic because it is not addressing a particular issue within the beneficiary entity. And at times, sometimes what do the entities do? They will request the beneficiary entities to issue a letter acknowledging support prior to that support actually being identified. So the issue is once sometimes you acknowledge the form of support, the entity is able to proceed and recognize points and they are not obligated to then uh, actually implement that support. And that is what we call an aspect around fronting. We cannot acknowledge support before that support is actually implemented. And we cannot then force the beneficiary entities to even provide that acknowledgement before you can actually implement the initiative. Now, when you talk about supply development, we indicated that these are those black entities on your supplier database. Then they also have enterprise development. Enterprise development looks at entities outside your supply database. It still has to be 51 and 100% blank owned entities or QSEs. This is a pillar that has been introduced to make sure that there's increased investment that is channeled towards entities or black owned entities. Now, also here, the legislation was amended in 2019 to recognize the fact that large entities meaning entities that the revenue is 50 million and above can continue to be beneficiaries of enterprise and supply development. But there are certain requirements then that needs to be met. The first requirement is that when the support was first initiated, these entities needed to either be an EME or a QSE. And once then they've exceeded that threshold for EMEs and QSEs, you can continue to support them, but the support can only be for a maximum of five years because then the legislation recognized that these entities themselves need to be doing something 
around the aspect of enterprise and supply development. And also one thing that we need to understand is that the B legislation has got sector codes. Uh, there are certain sectors such as your ICT sector, uh, your construction, your property, marketing, advertising, and communication, that when they determine that B measurement, they look at it within the context of the triple B sector codes. Now, if you are within the sector that has a sector code, then your enterprise and supplier development initiatives they need to be sector specific. So if you're within the ICT space, when you identify beneficiaries for supply development or enterprise development, it needs to be those black owned entities that are participating within that particular sector. Now, there are various ways in which the B legislation tries to make sure that it provides financial support or non-financial for aspect around localization or for the development of black owned entities. Another pillar is the pillar around uh, multinationals. There are multinationals in the legislation that because they're not able to dilute their ownership structures, the legislation requires them to do something uh, through form of investment. And that investment or that program, we refer to it as equity equivalent investment program. When they are approved to participate on that program because they have to demonstrate that they cannot dilute ownership and they have to demonstrate that they have a global policy that wherever they operate outside of their home countries, they do not dilute shareholding. Then they will then receive uh, approval to participate on the equity equivalent investment program. And part of the areas that they can focus into, wherein they can choose to channel 25% of the value of the South African operation or 4% of annual revenue from the South African operation, they can look at aspects around supply development. Now, that gives an opportunity to increase form of funding for Black-owned entities because generally it's one of the challenges that we've identified that Black businesses will always indicate that there's limited access to affordable financing. So this pillar also provides that opportunity. And then we'll also... Two minutes to go. Okay, thank you. I will try to cover the remaining slides. Thank you, Rams. And the legislation also through August of State and Public Entities does make available increased funding because organs of state and public entities also have to implement the legislation. They also have to comply with aspects around enterprise and supplier development. So also there, through the 0.2% of allocated budget, they can implement supply development initiatives. And also through the 0.1% around enterprise development of allocated budget, they can also implement enterprise development initiatives. Now, also, the different types of enterprise and supply development, it could be paying for registration or licensing fees, uh, providing IT-related infrastructure for Black-owned entities, subsidizing their rental, providing them with trading equipment and tools, uh, providing or supporting them through professional and consulting services, or even aspect around the provision of loans, whether it's loans with 0% interest or it's loans with reasonable interest. Those are the different types that enterprise and supply development can take. And also, there's also an element around social economic development, which requires one person of net profit after tax to be spent uh, annually to support black people in rural and underdeveloped areas. And forms of support there could be development capital grant contribution, which will then provide that opportunity for black people within those rural and underdeveloped areas to participate in the mainstream economy and to be able to tap into those industries where you find that black people are norm normally not featured, such as the green economy. Some of the challenges that we identify, the station says the beneficiaries of enterprise... Can I ask that we deal with the challenges in the Q&A? Okay. I think we... With yeah, our time is mind. Up. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry to do that, but I think maybe as a Q&A, we can deal with that subject uh, of yes. challenges. Because I was actually going to ask you about challenges. Okay. So, That's officially, okay. Lindue, uh, thank you very much, Lindue Matonsela. She's a senior manager, education, advocacy, and awareness at the Triple BEE Commission. So, folks, uh, this is the time to engage with our speakers. Uh, but I thought I should say something that I did not say when we be began this uh, second workshop uh, you know they say assumption is a mother of all messes so 
I assume that everybody who's here was is the same person who was in the first workshop to introduce myself. I am Rems Magot, and I'm the, the facilitator of all the workshops today. So if I did not introduce myself, there was no arrogance in it. I just did a huge assumption mistake. But thank you very much for joining. I can see there are people, lots of people on the platform. Very interestingly, Amanda, they're interrogating you more than they're interrogating Lindy Webb. But that's fine. <laughs> because I have my own interrogation of Lindy Webb. I've got millions of questions for the both of you. But I'm going to start with a question on the platform. That came from a number of people. Uh, Adele Gilbert asked a question, and I think she was joined by a few other people in that question, which I thought was very critical. She asked uh, uh, Amanda, uh, can you explain when one needs a trademark and one needs a patent? I suppose what we mean is <laughs> what's the difference between the two? And there could also be an issue of copyright, because I think it's not necessarily the same with the other two. Yeah, Rams, that's a very good question. And um, for all the years I've been working for government, and it's going on 30 now. So um, it's been You're a long a time. You're a stayer. You're a stayer. There's some positiveness in that. All right, so let me try in, in a very limited time. And it, it will take some time for you to understand the concepts. But we are still asked on a daily basis, can I copyright my patent? So people doesn't understand the difference between the various intellectual property rights. So there's a huge difference between a patent, a trademark, a copyright, a design, a trade secret. So all of these things are different forms of intellectual property rights. To understand it, you can think of they all fruit, but one is a pear and one is an apple and the others are grapes. And um, I think the copyright area is the grapes because there's the related rights as well. So when you apply for a patent, you must think about the substance of medicine, for instance. It's a recipe or it's a way in which you put together an, a new idea. There's an inventive step linked to it. So there's a patent in a paperclip. Somebody thought it's good to bend it in this way and then attach it to paper and there's a patent in that a new way of doing something, and that becomes a patent, and you register it through a different process. Trademarks are easy. Trademarks are like this Volpre bottle I have here. It's a distinctive symbol or picture or element that, that differentiates your product from the next product. If you have another different bottle of water, Aquila, for instance, their trademarks differentiate the products from one another. And it also gives you the assurance that the company behind the trademark <clears throat> is guaranteeing the, the, the product, the quality of the product. So when I wear my Nike or my polo t-shirts, I don't wear branded goods. But when you do wear them, you have a certain trust in the quality, the social practices of the company behind the trademark. So it's in essence, the trademark can be either a chime, because we all know the chime for Vodacom is a registered trademark. It could be a symbol. It could be a word. And in later years, we've also had smells being trademarked. So it differentiates your product from the next one. And it can be a name or a symbol, as I explained. And it's different from copyright. Copyright, there's nine categories of copyright. So you Ooh. get Books, yes, that's why I referred to them as the grapes, <laughs> a lot of grapes in a bunch. So you have books, you've got films, you've got software, you have music, um, you have uh, pho photograph, photographs, and the other two just eludes me now. <clears throat> but, but there's nine categories and there's related rights to copyright as well. And remember that you cannot register copyright in South Africa. You have a system in America, but it's also not a very good working system because you still have to prove your right once somebody contests it. So copyright is a very important right to have. All of us are creative and all of us can make something new. And the test to see if you have something that can be copyrighted, Judge Harams, a very well-known appeal court judge in South Africa, very involved in the IP area, he said, it's the sweat of the brow. So if you've put any effort in producing something new, it becomes a copyright um, piece of material that can be protected and that can uh, be utilized. 
You actually have answered my next question because I was about to ask you why is it important. Now I know it's the sweat of the brow and I need to protect my sweat of the brow. But here's another question from Shireen Makanye. She says, when registering IP, does that also cover international? I think you, you are partly going there, but yeah, please help us yeah. with that. Okay, so a very important fact on trademarks is that they're territorial. And that means they're protected in the territory where you register them, the country. Um, because these rights are per country. So it's not per province. You, you don't have to register them in Cape Town and Gauteng. But when you register them with CIPC, they protect it in South Africa. And you have to similarly register them in other countries if you want protection there. And that's why we have trademark attorneys. They assist in this process. And that's also why we have the World Intellectual Property Organization. Because all the countries in the world, or most of them, belongs to WIPO and there's systems in place. They call it the Madrid system, where when you register a trademark in your country, there's assistance to get it registered in your trading partner countries. So if you want to export to Europe, for instance, it's good to register your trademark in the EU, the um, European Union IP office, because then your protection is across Europe. So my last question, because you've just mentioned it, you've just mentioned like, Attorneys, you know that word, attorney. It, it then sends a message to me and everybody listening to us and say, can I afford to register these things? Because suddenly now I'm adding lawyers into the into the, the value chain and there's a small producer somewhere in a little corner called Soweto that you may not know about. Do I, can I afford it? Well, now that you know me, you can definitely afford it, Rams. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the good news. You cannot make use of any agent unless they're a registered attorney, but nobody prevents you as the owner of the IP right, the owner of the trademark, to register it with CIPC at 580 rand. Then your registration is in place. We've made it easy. So please take up the challenge, register your trademarks. And if you need any assistance, we are there. We have trademark searchers that can assist you and guide you through the process. I'm a bargain hunter and I found one. 580 rand. Guys, let's go for it. Let's flood her with our ideas and let's get, let's get them patented and copyrighted and, and trademarked. So, Lindy, why? Why do you think that, or rather, let me rephrase the question and ask you the, 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 the question of what we are about to say. What are the challenges with BE? and PE registration and compliance? What are the common challenges and why are they challenges? All right. Maybe let me start with the last one. Why are they challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, they are challenges because they basically make sure that at the end of the day, the economy is not transformed. Uh, they are derailing what the legislation wants us to achieve, which is that state of equality. Now, the challenges can be categorized in a number of ways. Uh, there are challenges that talks to non-compliance. You've got entities that are not complying. Uh, and then under non-compliance, you can also categorize entities. There are entities that are not complying because they're of the view that they can continue to trade and do business without them being compliant. Uh, and then the non-compliance of those who do business with them causes them to be not doing anything on BEE. For example, the legislation will say, if you're an organized or public entity, when you undertake your economic opportunities, deal with entities that are B compliant. So if I'm issuing licenses, it says I must issue licenses to B compliant entities. So if I don't do that, it means, and I don't include B as a criteria, those entities that are getting license from me, uh, there's nothing that forces them to be compliant. So that's why the non-compliance is at different levels. And then also you've got entities that appear to be compliant, but they're not complying. Uh, that is where sometimes we pick up aspects around fronting, that an entity could appear that, for example, they've got black directors, they've got black shareholders, or they're even implementing enterprise and supply development. But when you look at it and you start to unpack this in those initiatives, you find that they're not complying with what the legislation is all about. So those are some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. But the biggest challenge is the aspect around fronting. And fronting uh, is dynamics, they differ. You've got fronting of people who are not aware, and you've got fronting of people who very much are aware. They just go into the arrangements, but only cry foul when the arrangement did not take place according to how the agreement was. 
Hmm. So, controversial, whatever I want to say. But if I am not controversial, then it's not me. Everybody who knows me know, knows that I'm, controversy is my second name. It's just that not in the ID. Could it also be that BE has a bad name? People are just fatigued with it, and therefore they take shortcuts. They try to cheat the system. It has not been packaged very well, and, mm. and therefore it's not winning. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's a controversial one. But let me attempt to answer it. Uh, you know, when you look at why BE has a bad name, it's all things that are not BE. Uh, most of the time when you look at BE, uh, people, when they say it has a bad name, they list some of these things. They either say uh, it's corruption. Uh, they either say it's uh, only focusing on the elite or the politically connected. But when you look at what the legislation is, those things you do not find there. So sometimes that is why the role around uh, what we do, advocacy, raising awareness, becomes critical. Because when you don't do that, then the wrong assumptions around triple BE, they continue. So some of the work that we do, for example, when you talk about when someone wants to say only the elite, I would just say look at the list of transactions that we publish on our website you will see that that transaction do include new players, do include companies that were recently formed uh, to show that you do have an opportunity for new entities who, to come into the space. Uh, sometimes, yes, there are challenges. For example, when you look at access to funding for black business, uh, sometimes the reason why they're not able to get access is the requirements that are set around that. One of the studies that you conducted as the commission around uh, major transactions these are ownership transactions that have to be registered with us and the value is 25 million and above. We had to look at the form of funding that is there. You find that the funding around government, it's very minimum. It's not even 2%. Bulk of the funding is vendor financing and some of the funding is by banks. So already by nature of a bank, you know banks, so that's how they fund. So they will not necessarily be giving preferential terms. So there's an opportunity for government to come into the space to allow for affordable financing for Black-owned entities. So that, that is why we talk about making sure that we put into perspective what the legislation is all about so that we remove the negative connotations that have been attached to what Triple B legislation is all about. Excellent. So unfortunately, we have run out of time and I can have you a million other questions that I would like to ask you. But I think that your contribution has been helpful. You've left us your contact details. Should yes. we need more, we need to go to you and ask more questions. My biggest takeout is that I just need 580 rand from my back pocket to protect mm. some of the work that I've created, the sweat of my brow to be protected. Mm. I like that phrase, Amanda. It's a beautiful phrase. Yes. Uh, Amanda Lutheran from uh, the CIPC and Lindu Amadonsela, thank you very much for your contribution and have a great day further. No, thank you very much. Thank you. So one of the secrets of business, folks, as I conclude this session, is that you have to be an opportunist as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. If you're not opportunistic, you're going to miss opportunities. That's it's as simple as that. And I think that's why I like a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a discussion, maybe, maybe a post. It's not even a discussion. Somebody on the platform here much, much earlier came in and posted something. Now, you could frown upon it. They call themselves... Uh, JMC, they look at upliftment and can offer uh, support for spaza shops. It may not have been relevant to our conversation, but they knew there were eyes here on this platform and they posted. That's how jockeys work. We look for opportunities. So me, uh, Shonis from Janet uh, Consulting, I think you, you rock. That's how we play this game. So I'm not saying, of course, we should now post these things and not concentrate on the conversations. We're going to take a lunch break. When we come back, we go to another sex uh, uh, workshop. It is not more interesting than any other we've had, but I'm going to give the topic. How to create a profitable business. Is that not why we get into business? They should all be profitable. But that's why you should join us when we come back. Thank you very much. i see you on the other side at 1 o'clock. Bye. Bye.